On this third Sunday of Easter, all three readings for the Mass make reference to the need to repent, the need to turn to God and have our sins washed away by the Saviour, Jesus Christ. In the first reading, we hear St. Peter say during the very first sermon given by him, by the church, he says, Now you must repent and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. Now he spends the first part calling them out on their sin, telling them you've done this, you've done that, you've, you've, you've crucified the Holy One of God. But then following that, he gives them the call to repentance. Now you must repent and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. In the second reading, we have St. John tell us, if anyone should sin, we have our advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, who is just. He is the sacrifice that takes our sins away, and not only ours, but the whole world's. And finally, in the Gospel, the risen Jesus himself instructs the church, saying that her mission includes that, in the name of Jesus, repentance for the forgiveness of sins would be preached to all nations. And that's interesting since the first recorded words of Jesus after his public ministry began are in the Gospel of Mark and he says, The time has come and the kingdom of God is closest at hand. Repent and believe the good news. So he begins his public mission, his public ministry, with that call to repentance. And now on this Easter Sunday evening, he's telling the church, Your mission is to call in my name the world to repentance. The call to repentance is always a component of the church's mission because calling us from sin to new life in union with God is exactly what the Lord Jesus came to do and by his death on the cross, he made it possible for us. If I am hearing the gospel preached week in and week out but don't feel challenged or urged to move away from sin and towards greater holiness and fidelity to God and his commandments, then I have to reckon with the fact that either perhaps I am not listening well or that a deficient version of the gospel is being delivered to me by the church or its representatives who have that mission of calling to repentance as part and parcel of the task of proclaiming the full gospel, the whole good news. I would like to focus a little on today's second reading from the first letter of St. John. He tells us that Jesus is the sacrifice that takes away our sins. Now, the word he uses for sacrifice in this context in the original Greek is quite precise. The type of sacrifice he's referring to is one of the blood sacrifices of the temple, which are offered to wash away sins and bring about or restore union with God. The word we use in English for that kind of sacrifice is atonement, an old English term which means at one meant. So an atoning sacrifice is literally a sacrifice which makes us at one with God. So St. John is reminding us that sin separates us from God, but the blood of Jesus poured out in atonement for those sins brings us into union with God. And isn't that the message of the Divine Mercy prayers, which we perhaps prayed last Sunday, uh, Divine Mercy Sunday? Eternal Father, I offer you the body and blood, soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. It's perhaps only this weekend that I notice that the prayer of the chaplet is alluding to this piece of scripture from the first letter of St. John. And then the prayer of the chaplet, for the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. That sorrowful passion Jesus underwent when he, as the Lamb of God, offered himself as a sacrifice which would take away the sins of the world. I don't know if you've noticed how many times the celebration of the Mass has us call out to God seeking mercy. <clears throat> Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Then in the Gloria, we pray, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Have mercy on us. 
seated at the right hand of the Father, Jesus is our advocate. He pleads for us because he loves us with an infinite merciful love, a love which drove him to sacrifice himself for our sake, for our benefit, and for the washing away of our sins. And we profess similar things in the creed. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death, was buried, and rose again on the third day. As the Mass progresses, there are various other references and appeals to God's mercy. And as we come to the Lord's Prayer, the Our Father, we once again ask the Lord for pardon. Forgive us our trespasses. Then we launch into the great call for mercy once again. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. And we are then invited to behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. The Mass, you see, is shot through with praise of God's goodness, greatness, power, majesty, and his merciful love. Woven into the fabric of this, our greatest prayer, are repeated appeals to the Lord to cleanse us from our sins, wash away our iniquities, and heal us of the wounds we have inflicted on ourselves by means of our sins. This is because the Mass is the great atonement sacrifice of Christ, done once and for all on Calvary 20 centuries ago, but made really and truly present in a sacramental way for us at this and every Mass. A proclamation of the Gospel, therefore, which does not include a call to repentance, that does not include a call to conversion, meaning a turning away from sin and a turning back to God, and a proclamation of the gospel that does not include an exhortation to confess our sins, especially in the sacrament of penance, is not the full proclamation of the gospel. Does it make any sense to proclaim that Jesus is the Lamb of God, the Redeemer, the Saviour, and not be clear on what he has redeemed us from, what he is saving us from? Jesus in today's gospel tells us that in his name, Repentance for the forgiveness of sins would be preached to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses to this. Indeed, the church is a witness to this, and it is her mission to call the whole world to repentance, to the change of heart and the change of ways, so that this earthly kingdom might resemble more and more the kingdom of God. The Church cannot accomplish this God-mandated and God-empowered mission of transforming all things in the name of Christ Jesus if she neglects the call to repentance. It's an unpopular aspect of the Gospel message, particularly in today's world where it seems anything goes. But though unpopular, it is necessary, and it is to the detriment of souls if the Church neglects to warn of the dangers of sin, unrepented sin. And of course, that repentance must begin within the church herself. If the members of the church, from first to last, fail to take on board the call to conversion and to turn fully to God, then she will look just like every other institution in the world and be ill-equipped for the task which Jesus has given her. In the early 20th century, the great English Catholic convert G.K. Chesterton wrote, We do not really want a religion that is right where we are right. What we want is a religion that is right where we are wrong. We do not want, as the newspapers say, a church that will move with the world. We want a church that will move the world. That he wrote about a hundred years ago but it is as valid today as it was then, perhaps more so. One thing is for sure, if the church in our day fails to practice repentance and fails to call the world to repentance in the name of Jesus, then the future of the world doesn't look too good. So where does the transformation and calling back of our world, our nation, our family members, ourselves to Christ begin? Well, Jesus gives the answer in the gospel today, 
in that upper room on that first Easter Sunday evening, as he stood with the small flock of the church, he declared that the call to repentance began right there in Jerusalem with them. And from there, it would spread throughout the world. It has to begin within the church and within your heart, within my heart. The gospel call to repentance, repentance has to take hold in us first. And then it is our task to encourage it in others, as the early church did. For the gospel so changed them, so caused them to live life differently, that it attracted the attention and admiration of all those around them. They looked at their lives and they wanted to be like them. They wanted to love like them, to be able to forgive like them. They wanted to get to know this message of the gospel. And more importantly, they wanted to get to know the Lord who founded that gospel message. The pagan heart of the Roman Empire was utterly transformed in Christ within just a few generations by the example of Christian living and the proclamation of the gospel call to repentance in Jesus' name. And that rampant paganism which is in our world today can and will also be transformed by that same witness of authentic Christian living out of the gospel, the full gospel, which includes the need to repent. But let me be very clear here. The call to repentance isn't about realizing how bad a sinner I am. It isn't an exercise in publicly or privately naming and shaming people for their wrongdoing. The call to repentance always includes the fact that we have a Savior and Redeemer in Christ Jesus. He is our advocate with the Father. He pleads our cause and he is all goodness, mercy and love. What good would it do me to know that I am a sinner in need of repentance if I have not been made aware that we have a God who loves sinners and pardons any and all faults that are repented of, that we have Jesus who is sent by the Father to be the remedy for our sins? It would be like going to a doctor who diagnoses that we have heart disease and then scolds us for having smoked all life long, having eaten too unhealthily for too long, and drank far too much too often, and so caused great damage to our heart. But then that doctor fails to give us any medication or remedy which would help or heal us. I don't turn up at the doctors to just get a diagnosis. I already know that I am sick. What I need is a diagnosis and then treatment, a remedy, a way back to health. The divine doctor of souls, Jesus, will help diagnose our sins. He will, by the power of the Holy Spirit, stir up in us an awareness of where we have gone wrong. And he uses the church to help us be clear on that. But he himself also provides the remedy. He himself is the remedy that heals and saves us. The church has the task of calling to repentance. Like St. Peter in his first sermon, she calls out where people have taken wrong turns. But she does it for the sake of their salvation. It's an act of love. And more than point out the ways of sin, she points out the way to salvation. In a sense, she proclaims, you have taken the wrong path and it is a dangerous one which leads to death. But there is another path, a better way, a way back. And it is a way that leads to life. Jesus Christ is that way. He is the way, the truth and the life. Turn back and follow his way. Come back to him and be healed and saved and you will have life. The call to repentance can be hard to hear, but it always has this immensely positive component. The truth that there is more love and mercy in God than there are miseries and sins in any and all of us. 
Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on us.